You have a bad case of something called mimetic desire. What's that? A random trip to Target, going for that Starbucks run, going out to eat when there's dinner at home. If someone with higher status and you want something, it means it's more likely that you will want it too. Spending 45 minutes at the grocery store. Some of your overspending is because of escapism. Everywhere you look, every conversation that surrounds you is in one way or another linked to money. Whether that is a current economic decline and a recession that is getting deeper and deeper, the stock market crashing, whether it is the student loan crisis or the fact that Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, or that the cost of living increases significantly every single year, whereas the wages for people are increasing at the rate of a snail. Every single year, the luxury market keeps increasing their prices in an attempt to make their product even more exclusive. I'm looking at you, Chanel. And every year, more and more people save left, right, and center to be able to afford the same luxury product that is trying to kick them out. So what is going on here? What is this desire to attain, or at least look like you've attained, a certain status? Why is the relationship between money and humans so stressful and complicated? And is in fact overspending a form of escapism, a form of control, or is it a desire to maintain a certain image? Let's get into it. Hi guys, my name is Yusra, welcome back to my channel. There are only so many calories to eat in a day, only so many sexual experiences, only so many different degrees of temperature that are comfortable, only so many styles of roof that can go over a person's head. When it comes to true needs, we don't need much. So let's assume you and a very close friend of yours are going out shopping. Now this friend of yours you really look up to, you guys have a great relationship, and she is known to be a little bit of a fashionista. So you guys go into a really cute boutique and you're not really sure if anything in there is your style, but then all of a sudden you look at your friend and her eyes sort of light up. And she goes, Yusra, this is literally the best boutique that I have ever walked into. Everything in here is so, so cute. And if I wear any of these outfits in the Amalfi Coast, I will literally have the best outfit there. Now all of a sudden, in various degrees, depending on who you are as a person, what your friend just said may have somewhat of an effect on you. You may now go around the store looking at everything a little bit more closely, maybe thinking to yourself, hmm, maybe I should get something here. Maybe something here does actually match my style. And that is the concept of mimetic desire. Mimetic desire is essentially a concept that was theorized by French philosopher slash professor slash other titles, um, René Girard. He theorized that human desire is neither linear nor individualistic. We essentially feed off each other and what one person has, the other person desires. Man is the creature who does not know what to desire, and he turns to others in order to make up his mind. We desire what others desire because we imitate their desires. Essentially, what this means is that we often look to others for direction on what we actually want without even realizing it. If your parents, your teachers, your friends, um, society in general thinks that something is beautiful, then you on an individual level may start to believe that something is actually beautiful or if it's a material thing, you might actually want to attain it. To take this one step further, René Girard also states that it is this concept of mimetic desire that also causes issues such as envy, rivalry, conflict, and violence. Because as Thomas Hobbes wrote in his book Leviathan, if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. Now, me personally, I'm like, okay, um, come on, you can't really influence me that much to where all of my desires are mimetic, right? I have my autonomy, I have my independence, and I know what I want. Well, René Girard would actually call me a romantic liar, where the romantic lie is me believing that I have any autonomy when it comes to my own individualistic desires. To me personally, to an extent, this, this does make sense. Why else do designers put like the most beautiful, at least what society deems to be the most beautiful um, models on their runways? Or why else has the entire realm of social media turned into this whole influencing market, right? It's because we as humans can get influenced. While I will need more scientific evidence to basically prove to me that all desire is mimetic, um, to quite an extent, a lot of our desires, I would say, are actually mimetic. 
and they are generated from society and they are generated from those around you and what you consume and what is consistently being sold or fed to you. And when it comes to materialism, this could heavily influence how we as humans want to spend our money. Because if we see others spend, um, it becomes a mimetic desire for us to spend. And if we see Rihanna carrying a Birkin bag, then all of a sudden, a lot of us ladies might actually want to carry a Birkin bag ourselves. From time immemorial, the concept of exclusivity has always existed when it comes to class. Aristocrats and royal families used to build castles for themselves at very, very high elevations to keep the common man out. The kind of jewelry, the luxury fabrics, the food that kings consumed, the common man could only fathom. And while we may think that the times of aristocracy and kings may be uh, something of the past, I would guide all of us to look at the world map and I'm sure we can all find countries where uh, the royal families and kingdoms still exist today. As such, speaking in current times, while things may appear a little bit different, things are essentially the same. The castles and the palaces, they've been replaced by um, the penthouses on Billionaire's Row um, right on Central Park. And in the same city where activists are fighting for the um, environment, um, the very ultra-rich are actually feeding on endangered species. 42 trillion of new wealth was created between December 2019 and December 2021. 26 trillion, which is 63%, was captured by the richest 1%, while 16 trillion, 37%, went to the bottom 99%. And that is exactly the point. There is a huge, absolutely huge delta that exists between the world's richest man and the world's poorest man. And if today, if any person in between these two men, a regular person, right, were given the opportunity to be rich, to be top dog, to be maybe even the richest man in the world, I of course believe that they would take it. So this then, the desire to be top dog, to be king, or at the minimum richer than you are right now. And while it's nice to, you know, fantasize about such a possibility, I think any person with a logical mind would say that it would be very, very hard and out of reach for an average man to achieve an elite status with the resources that he's given. A majority at least, right? The average person is living paycheck to paycheck, like trying very hard to make ends meet in a, in a world where cost of living is increasing every day and wages really aren't. But even the average person desires for more in their life. And of course, as they should, there's nothing wrong with that. If there was no desire or ambition um, essentially to elevate your status, um, I would argue that, you know, there would be no such thing as Ponzi schemes or pyramid schemes or MLMs or every other day, a new finance channel popping up on YouTube with these fake gurus trying to sell you get rich quick schemes, right? I mean, literally these fake gurus are here on YouTube saying, here are 20 different passive income ideas and all you have to do is take your feed pics and post them online. <laughs> it's the fake finance gurus and those at the top of the pyramid in these like Ponzi schemes they are the ones that are making money off of our desire to elevate our status or to get richer without providing any real strategy on how to actually get there. And what does it actually mean to even make it or to get there, right? Well, that target essentially will change from person to person. But what I will say is that that target for person to person is getting harder and harder to achieve every single year. The concept of luxury for the common man and I use common man very loosely here because within the realm of common men, there is a huge delta, right? While one person might take one paycheck to pay off an emergency hospital bill or a luxury bag, another person might actually have to save for six months in order to pay that off. And both of them fall within the average, right? So take the definition of the common man with a grain of salt. But as I was saying, accessibility to the luxury market for the common man, and again, take that with a grain of salt, in the West, right, is relatively a new concept. The rise of logos, um, logomania, um, the rise of Louis Vuitton, Fendi, and Prada, this is all relatively new. And I would say a couple of decades ago, if you went into a mall versus going into a mall now, there is a significantly more amount of this luxury that you will see um, on the common men, every other person that's walking around in these malls. So what has happened? Well, in the pursuit of their mimetic desires, people are basically like, well, if I cannot achieve the status of the rich, I will at least maintain the image of being rich. But you know what's tragic? 
Now that us as common people have this access to, um, you know, luxury per se, and again, I speak of this from a very strictly first world perspective, right? Now that luxury is more accessible, more mainstream, guess what? The goalpost, the target has now changed. Folks that either saved up to treat themselves with the luxury item or maybe folks that perhaps climbed the ladder to where, you know, they couldn't afford these things before, but now they've worked hard and they can achieve it now. Well, you know what they're being called now? New money. Once again, they're excluded. And of course, new money gets the mean girl treatment from old money always. Because like I said, aristocracy back in the day and old money today, what have they always wanted? Exclusivity. Old money has done everything in their power to maintain their riches, to maintain their status, right? To the point where now that new money has come into the picture, they're like, you know what? You think you've achieved a certain level of luxury? Well, guess what? That's not the target anymore. Oh, you just bought a Louis Vuitton bag with all the logos? You know what? That's not in fashion anymore. All the logos, all the colors? Yeah, new money. You know what the new status is? The boring beige, the clean aesthetic, no logos, no color, no fun, quiet. Chanel is literally increasing its prices on its luxury goods every single year by about 10%, if not more. And once you go ahead and are able to afford that Chanel bag, you know what you are? New money. You're not, you're not good enough. The attainment of status for the average person is, like I said, a moving target and one that you are very, very unlikely to achieve. Because once you get to one point, guess what? It's changed. It's moving. As such, the desire to be rich or at the minimum to appear rich, whether it's mimetic or not, it may actually leave you feeling empty. Because as you climb one hill, the next one appears to be even steeper. As I mentioned earlier on in the video, human beings have a very complicated relationship with money, at least a lot of us. And for many, money is either a lingering or a consistent cause of stress in their life. Consumers experiencing stress may show increased saving behavior, which assures the consumer that monetary resources will be available when needed. Alternatively, consumers experiencing stress may show increased spending behavior, Spending, however, is directed specifically towards products the consumer perceives to be necessities, which are products that allow for control in an otherwise uncontrollable environment. These divergent findings can inform the development of a different view of the consequences of stress, which proposes that certain behaviors are negatively influenced by stress, whereas other behaviors are positively influenced. I mean, this is quite fascinating because stress when it comes to spending or finances can have a very opposite effect from one person to another. In that while for some, it may appear to actually increase the amount of saving that a person does, um, you know, it may be excessive or perhaps it's just a better management of your finances. For others, it is the completely opposite effect where they are spending, overspending like crazy. And both of these scenarios actually occur from the same um, you know, root cause, which is the desire to actually control your environment, which you find to be uncontrollable because of your complicated and stressful relationship with money. In fact, many hoarding behaviors are triggered by extreme stressors, such as loss of a spouse, eviction, and divorce. This suggests that when an individual's sense of control is compromised, they may feel comfort and increased control through hoarding any personal possessions. And while for some, this stress may manifest in, you know, being able to manage finances really, really well to the point of saving excessively, um, for other people, in order to get some sort of a semblance of control in their life, they are overspending to the points that are, of course, unhealthy. And you can imagine for immigrant groups and immigrant parents, like my parents, for example, you know, were immigrants and, you know, finances were always the, at the forefront of their minds. It was a major cause of stress in their relationship. One study was conducted which focused on um, 100 parents from immigrant families. Many noted that they are trying to find as much work as possible, but still are living paycheck to paycheck. They noted that the costs of rent and groceries continue to increase, making it difficult to make ends meet. In another study, compared to native-born persons, immigrants are more likely to be represented among the unemployed populations. Unemployment can pose a mental health threat in three different ways. One, it leads to poverty, giving less opportunity to acquire education and access to 
quality health care. Two, it is a frustrating and stressful experience that has the potential to lead to more mental health problems and illness. And three, it leads to unhealthy coping strategies, namely drinking, gambling, smoking, or drug abuse. As such, there are different conditions under which, um, you know, financial stress may become a part of your life. It may be extreme, it may be a systemic issue, or it may actually be from one very traumatic experience in your life. But there's many different conditions that could cause financial stress in your life. And what that stress does, it leads to extreme responses, right? Like I said earlier, for others, it may, you know, increase these hoarding tendencies to hoard or save money. Um, and for others, like I said, overspending, you know, trying to gather as many material possessions as possible. And immigrants in specific, because they, you know, face so much financial hardship in their lives, can you imagine this addiction that could be a part of your life just because of financial stress? Um, that addiction being drugs or alcohol or gambling? And of course, um, you know, such extreme responses, whether it comes to hoarding or overspending or addictions because of financial stress, effects of these are going to seep into the next generation. As for most things, where there is a yin, there is a yang. And as we have more and more conversations of materialism and overconsumption, overspending, you know, the luxury market, quiet uh, versus loud, uh, you know, luxury or old versus new money. Of course, more and more people are now also talking about the concepts of minimalism. Now, before financial minimalism was a thing, at least that I knew about, I knew minimalism as a form of art. Minimalism emerged in New York in the early 1960s among artists who were self-consciously renouncing recent art they thought had become stale and academic. A wave of new influences and rediscovered styles led younger artists to question conventional boundaries between various media. The new art favored the cool over the dramatic. Their sculptures were frequently fabricated from industrial materials and emphasized anonymity over the expressive excess of abstract expressionism. When it comes to financial minimalism, however, um, the concept essentially is to shift focus away from money or the attainment of resources and to try to live more meaningful, happy, fulfilling lives. Minimalism calls for re-evaluating life priorities, moving away from the accumulation of goods and deriving satisfaction from relationships and activities that bring more substance to life. To understand minimalism, it is vital to be cognizant of voluntary simplicity, VS, first, a concept preceding minimalism. Dwayne Elgin introduces the concept of VS and explains it as the contemporary simplicity movements that fueled the anti-consumerist and environmental views of the 1990s. Voluntary simplicity denotes the choice to live a consumption-free and straightforward lifestyle. People adopting VS do so of their own free will and seek sources of satisfaction other than material acquisitions. Now, there are different rules when it comes to minimalism that are just like a Google search away. There's the 90-90 rule where um, you're only allowed to keep uh, material possessions that you've essentially used in the past 90 days. There's also a 30-30 rule where essentially if you're, you know, on the fence about making a purchase of, for something that costs greater than $30, you ask yourself the question on whether you can live without it for the next 30 days and you make that purchase based off the answer. Um, during my Google search, there's also a one-in-one -one rule, a five-second rule, an 80-20 rule. There are a lot of rules um, when it comes to minimalism and my assumption is that you can pick and choose um, essentially what works for you. The thing is that different things uh, fulfill different people. So, you know, as with discussing any new concept, there are of course going to be nuances and caveats, right? Because to me, um, you know, if all of the rules for minimalism are to be enforced, it seems like minimalism would be just as extreme and restrictive as overspending or materialism would be extreme and lavish. It's funny because there was this one YouTuber who I saw, um, you know, who was basically saying that, you know, her entire um, goal for the year was to be minimalistic and to not spend any money on luxury items. And literally, like, a few weeks later, I kid you not, she was doing this massive uh, luxury haul, um, you know, where she was unboxing, like, this new Dior bag and, like, a lot of other items, right? I mean, I think she was onto something here because it really got me thinking about the concept, um, you know, of finding balance when it comes to your spending and really how critical that actually is. 
And just one thing that I've noted, um, you know, about the luxury community on YouTube is that a lot of these people do talk about these, um, you know, luxury purchases as their addictions or you're even going to find addiction in their like channel name and stuff like that. I mean, I for sure do not judge anybody for their addictions. And if material possessions make you happy, of course, by all means, go for it. And of course, you know, I personally love and enjoy watching a lot of the luxury videos that are out there. But this did make me think about the concept of balance when it comes to spending. And, you know, it did, it did get me thinking about the fact that, you know, how much of this addiction is for your happiness versus how much of it is you trying to, you know, essentially fill up a hole uh, within you. It's something to think about. And when it comes to that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal experience now. Now, like I mentioned earlier, I am the daughter of immigrants and as such, I'm first generation, um, you know, American. So as you can imagine, um, I grew up uh, very humble because my parents did not have much as I was growing up. My mom definitely instilled in me, um, you know, the concepts of working hard and financial independence, especially as a woman. She really stressed how important it was for me as a girl to have my own money and to have, you know, a very good education. And one important thing that she told me was that, you know, if something seems too good to be true, it usually is. So your girl over here, you know, she got educated, you know, undergrad, master's, all that stuff, right? And for me growing up, I used to think of like six figures as such a, you know, big target to achieve. So that was my first target within my career. I was like, you know what, whatever it takes, I'm going to work very hard and I'm going to reach this first goal of making six figures. But as you guys know that when one part of your life starts to go really well, um, another part of your life absolutely starts to crumble. So when I actually started making six figures um, in my career, um, at the same time, my personal life was in absolute shambles. So I said, you know what, Yusra, you need to treat yourself. You're going through a horrible time right now. You're making six figures. Let's go out and let's buy something that's going to make us happy. You know, like I said, treat yourself. So I go into the mall with my mom and I'm like, you know what? We're going to try to make our first luxury purchase today. And guess what I bought? <laughs> this Versace bag. It's funny because I bought this uh, Versace bag and, you know, like the luxury community would probably not even consider this proper luxury or they may laugh at it and joke about it, you know? I will say, however, that this color combination got picked up by Valentino last year, so like, I guess it wasn't that bad of a choice. But even when I was buying this bag, um, it was my first luxury purchase, I was filled up with like so much emotion when I bought this. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe I've, uh, you know, made it to this point where I can actually buy myself something so expensive. And boy, oh boy, this experience, it made me so happy, so overwhelmed. I was just very emotional that day. But that happiness that I got from buying this bag, um, it lasted about, I don't know, two weeks, one month. And then I had to go back to my normal life and, you know, face those same personal issues that I was going through at that time. So I was like, you know what? Let's go to the mall again. Let's make that next luxury purchase. So this time I go to the mall and this time I buy myself a YSL bag. And then a few months later, I go back and I buy myself another luxury something. You know, I keep making these luxury purchases for about two years and it was those two years of my life that were extremely difficult and just personally yeah one of the worst um, I would say phases of my life um, from a personal standpoint and I look back at that now and I really think to myself was it really these material purchases that were making me so happy or was I trying to find you know a thrill or an escape just for the meantime so I could for a moment just forget about you know the struggles that I was going through in my personal life after that painful phase was over, the crazy thing is that my desire to go to the mall and make that next luxury purchase, that also sort of like died down. All of a sudden, I was not into luxury shopping as much as, you know, you know, back when I started. And let me tell you something, I'm still a fashion girly and I will absolutely indulge, but my spending when it comes to luxury um, is so much more responsible today than it was in those two years, um, the difficult two years of my life. I don't, you know, indulge in those impulses that I once had, but what's the difference, right? And I have to question this at least from a personal perspective, right? That's, you know, it's my personal experience. I had to question 
How much happiness do material possessions actually provide you? And in those two years of my life, um, you know, where I was making purchase after purchase, was it to attain a certain level of, you know, happiness when it comes to material possessions? Or was it because I felt hollow in other parts of my life and I wanted to fill those holes with these purchases? I mean, I can answer those questions when it comes to me on a personal perspective. And the answer to that, of course, is going to change you know, person to person. How much of it is filling a hole? How much of this is overspending? And how much of it is just what it is? It's responsible and it's just treating yourself. And now imagine that you have saved for about three months and you're about to treat yourself with a very nice Burberry bag, but you want it to be practical. And so you carry it after work and take it to a party where you've been invited, um, you know, by this rich guy. And it's then this happens. What? What's even in there? Huh? Flat shoes for the subway or lunch pail? I mean, Greg, it's monstrous. You know what the funniest thing is when I saw this on Succession? The guy that makes the comment, Tom, he's not even the person that comes from the billionaire status, right? This man actually came from nothing and married into a family of billionaires, okay? And he always has a power struggle, um, you know, with his billionaire wife. And in the show, he's seen to be slowly but surely climbing up, you know, trying to be the next, you know, successor in the show. I'm digressing, but the funny thing to me in all of this depiction was that this guy wasn't even one that came from generational wealth himself. The point is, okay, going back to the girl that actually carried the Burberry bag, you know, about whom the comment was made, right? Now, if she had heard this comment, she could have reacted in two different ways based on two different scenarios. One, if, for example, this bag was something that was a product of overspending, of her trying to control certain elements of her life, um, directly from her mimetic desire, essentially, and the desire to appear wealthy, to achieve and look like, you know, she's from a, you know, elite status, essentially to fit in with the rich, perhaps this comment to her would be a devastating blow. But if, for example, the girl had bought this bag within her means, you know, it was just a method to treat herself and, you know, it wasn't too much of a financial pressure on her, you know, and she has more of an individualistic, um, you know, desire than uh, Rene Girard would like to admit. Do you think this would affect her just as much, um, you know, when comparing it to the previous scenario? I don't know. I don't think so. I think she'd be able to brush it off a lot more easily. Like I said, most people would like to be rich, if not richer than their current state. And if, for example, they can't be rich, I would argue that a lot of people would at least like to portray a certain image, a presentable image, or this image to appear rich, right? And if, for example, they don't even want to be rich, or they don't even care to appear rich at the minimum, they might want to treat themselves. Or you're one of these people that's like over all of it and you're like, you know, I have nothing to do with material possessions. I am a person that, you know, follows minimalism and I'm going to live in a tiny home off the grid. Whatever category you fall into, at the end of the day, money continues to be an extremely complicated entity in all situations. Money is undeniably a power within itself, but while doing research for this video, I came to the conclusion that it's not how much or how little you spend that leads to your financial happiness. It is actually having a healthy relationship with money that leads to financial success and happiness. Maybe um, extra material possessions are what are going to give you that extra boost of happiness or whether it's more savings in your bank account that are going to make you feel more comfortable is a person to person thing. Neither is right, neither is wrong, but what matters is that your spending, overspending, lack of spending, whatever you want to call it, right, occurs within your financial means. If you have a complicated or stressful relationship with money, trying to hoard it or trying to overspend it is not going to give you the control that you think it will. So whether you want to practice minimalism or you want to delve yourself into the um, you know, world of materialism, I think the most critical thing is to do it within your means, find a balance that works for you, and to really be responsible with the financial hand that you've been dealt with in this life. Alright you guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe. 
Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below on whether you prefer a life of minimalism or overspending. And if it's overspending, is it a form of escapism or is it to treat yourself? I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.